All right, so a little special episode of that SEC podcast. Cousin Shane needed the day off, so I went to the go-to source for college football information. I like to call him the CFB Encyclopedia. Stephen Lassen, of course, senior editor of Athlon Sports, and we have got a fun idea for this show. How you doing, Stephen? Thank you so much for joining me once again. Hey, Mike, it's great to be back on. Thanks for having me. And it's it's always good to be talking some SEC college football during the offseason. I guess we're still calling it the offseason these days. Is Cousin Shane having eligibility concerns? Is he is it load management? Is he entering the transfer portal? I don't know. Uh, but hey, good to join you. I think the best way to explain it, you you hit the nail on the head there. Load management. He needed a day off from. I think he's got work off. He's he's got his kids are are away, so it's like he just needed a Shane day, and we're giving it to him. So he is very very appreciative, Stephen, of you joining the show here. Hey, it's it's always good to talk to you and be talking some SEC ball. Like I said, I mean, man, I I know it's the off season, but at the same time, we've got. Transfer portal movement, it's talking season, shameless plug, the Athlon Sports Magazine comes out on May 23rd. So uh, the talking season uh, is kind of just starting to ramp up. So we're, we're always looking for good content and happy to fill in for Shane, as always. And where do fans go, Stephen, if they want to pre-order the Athlon Sports College Football Preview Magazine? Absolutely. So it hits newsstands on May 23rd. So I guess this would be like your normal like grocery, your bookstores. You should be able to find it there. But if you don't want to fight the store and deal with, you know, crazy, you know, lines and all that, <laughs> you can just go to AthlonSports.com and you click on magazines at the very top. It takes you to our store. We have two different SEC versions and it's an SEC East and an SEC West cover. It's the same content in both, um, but those are just the two SEC covers this year. The East version has a couple different teams on it, including Joe Milton. The West version has a couple different teams on it as well. Kool-Aid McKinstry uh, from Alabama, one of the featured players as well. So athlonsports.com, that's where you can order it if you don't want to wait till May 23rd. Yeah, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes so fans can just simply click the link. they get directed right to it. It's the go-to college football preseason magazine, in my opinion. So Stephen cannot wait to get my hands on that Athlon Sports college football preview magazine. But... On to what we got lined up on this show, Stephen. A really great, uh, fun idea I had. And uh, like I said, I respect your opinion uh, when it comes to college football matters as much as anybody. So I thought you would be the perfect person to have on the show to kind of debate. Stephen, I asked him in advance to come up with a team. I did the same of our all-time SEC team. So we're each going to pick a quarterback two running backs, two receivers, a tight end, an offensive line, and we'll do the exact same for the defensive side. And then when we get to the end, compare the two. I'll throw them up on the screen if you're watching on YouTube. Throw it up on all our social media channels after the show airs. And uh, I'm just interested to see what the fans think, Stephen. Who would win a game head-to-head, your ultimate SEC team versus my ultimate SEC team? How's that sound? Hey, it sounds great, man. You know, the, the hard part about this is, you know, I started watching college football around, you know, 93, 94 or so. So I'm now I'm dating myself. But, you know, it, you know, players, you know, since that era, like you start by I always start by just trying to go like off the top of my head and you start building a list of like quarterbacks you watched and you start trying to go from like 20 to one. And the same thing with running backs and receivers. And I think, you know, you can do this for a lot of different conferences in college football, but you keep coming back to one thing and the talent in this conference is so ridiculous. And it's so many hard decisions that I've had to make of players that I've watched um, in, in my lifetime. And you try to fight like recency bias. A lot of times you can't go wrong in choosing some of these positions. So I'm excited to see what you have in, in, from your team. <laughs> yeah. So these lists, they'll be a little subjective, but uh, let's start with you, Stephen, who would be your all time SEC quarterback it's there are no wrong answers there's been so many good quarterbacks in the SEC but I guarantee you whoever you say Stephen it's a wrong answer to 13 other fan bases so you only get one choice who you taking to win a football game 
all-time SEC players. And I should have mentioned, you know, we're not counting, uh, you know, Missouri players that were not in the league, South Carolina players that were not in the league, and obviously not Texas and Oklahoma players because they're not in the league just yet. Uh, but taking all that into consideration, Stephen, who's your all-time SEC quarterback? Man, this was one of the toughest decisions, you know, kind of like I mentioned, if you start making a list of quarterbacks in the SEC, you know, it's Cam Newton, Johnny Manziel, um, you know, even going back to the 90s, Peyton Manning, uh, Tim Couch. I settled on Tim Tebow. Um, I think he's one of the greatest players of, you know, this of, of, of my lifetime, modern era of college football, Heisman winner, two time SEC offensive player of the year. But not only that, just that 2007 season, the monster 55 touchdowns and just kind of the way that he helped Florida get to the national championship and win it. So I just think he's one of the greatest quarterbacks of, of, that I've seen in, in my time watching college football. So I'm going with Tim Tebow. But like you said, man, you can't go wrong with Cam Newton or Johnny Manziel or some of these others here. Right. Well, great minds think alike, Stephen. We did not compare lists prior to revealing these, but I got Tim Tebow too. And, uh, you know, I, I remember that recruitment was crazy. Urban Meyer, Nick Saban. I mean, I think I think it came down to, to Alabama and Florida. And I just remember him playing as a freshman. They won the national championship, but he was in a uh, – he, obviously Chris Leak was the, the starter, but he kind of came off the bench and provided a spark. And I just remember thinking, this guy's a joke. I mean, he's like a fullback. You know what I mean? Like they're going to roll with this guy his sophomore season, and then he put together one of the most – just special seasons I've ever seen in my life. And maybe this is not the right way I should have done this list, Stephen, but I, I also kind of catered to guys that, that did it multiple seasons and particularly guys that came back when, you know, I, I realized Tim Tebow probably was not the, you know, all-time SEC NFL prospect, but he could have went pro after his junior year and he would have been drafted. Um, and I know obviously he was a first rounder after his senior year, but that is a big reason Tim Tebow on my list as well. Just the ultimate college football player, toughness, leadership, uh, the speech. I mean, how many how many quarterbacks give a speech? Uh, you know that is uh, memorized on the stadium down there at the swamp. It's Tim Tebow, and just like you, I love Johnny Manziel. He's probably close to to two for me. Cam Newton. I think if you want to say just one season. I don't think anybody did a better one-season job than, than Cam Newton leading Auburn to the national championship. And I would also throw Joe Burrow into that mix. But again, Tim Tebow, for me, did it better for longer, if that makes sense. So give me Tim Tebow. I, I hate to be boring, but we got the same quarterback. I don't know how the same quarterbacks go face off against each other, but we're going to do it, damn it. it. You know, I think that's that's the challenge of all these quarterbacks is like – you, know, you mentioned Cam Newton in the one season, Joe Burrow's season where, you know, he led LSU to the national championship, man. I mean, that's up there as far as just the most prolific, productive, ridiculous seasons by a quarterback. You know, even going back, you know, I mentioned Peyton Manning, about Eli Manning. I know he didn't play in the SEC, but I think we need to mention Chase Daniel, the career that he had at Missouri. The, the SEC in the, the modern era of college football has had some really, really good quarterbacks, but it's hard to argue with the, the productivity the longevity, that's something that that I fought with this too. You know, how do you go with guys who had one great season? You know, we'll get to receivers and Jamar Chase is in this discussion too versus guys who had two, three, and four years of, of productivity. Mm. All right, so we're going to do two running backs, Stephen. So I'll let you name your two and, and maybe any honorable mention you have. Again, this one, this may be even tougher than quarterback because uh, just for years and years, the SEC was a running back dominant conference and still I mean the best running backs in the country typically do come through the SEC who are your two running backs that you'd put on this list man I hate to be boring and say this is another tough call but it really is so you know since I started watching you know college football I think you know Mike you mentioned this that, that it has changed from a rushing sort of three yards in a cloud of dust to more of a passing league. And you can kind of see this if you start making a list of running backs, you know, since about 93 or so, and you start looking at the record books. I think one of the easiest selections though, was Darren McFadden, just the wild hog, the all around productivity. Um, you know, he and Felix Jones, the one, two punch, the way they carried those Arkansas teams, easy pick fun to watch the speed, the power. It was all there for him. One of my favorite players to watch, uh, in the, in since my time watching college football, 
The other one, I went with Derrick Henry. I think that that season in 2015, you know, over 2,000 yards, 28 touchdowns. I mean, the amount of carries, almost 400 carries that season. So I went with, in my lifetime, it's McFadden and Derrick Henry. I could go with some other guys in there too, you know, Cadillac Williams, Leonard Leonard Fournette. Uh, Also randomly, I know this name is, he only had a very short stint at LSU, but I don't know if Cecil Collins at LSU, that very short time that he played, and I know he had some off the field issues, but man, when I watched him play back in, I think, 97, I thought this is guy's going to be the next great running back in the in the SEC. Yeah. Well, and, and I should note, again, kind of limited it to players of our lifetime. So for people saying, well, how the hell do you not have Herschel Walker, Bo Jackson? I mean, they're great. We've seen the highlights, but... I literally, I don't think I was alive when they were playing yeah. <laughs> in the SEC. So it's like, I mean, I can't count those guys. But again, yeah, they're on the Mount Rushmore. But again, this is a, this is our list, guys. We've seen play, and, and I hate to be boring, but my number one is also Darren McFadden. I mean, how can you not have him? He should have been a Heisman winner, Stephen. Um, I was in college when Arkansas played at Tennessee. I went to the game, and I remember I was like, man, Tennessee just corralled this. Darren McFadden, I th- you know, I've been hearing all this hype. And really, the reason I thought that is because he didn't have, you know, a 90-yard touchdown run. I looked at the box score at the end of the game. He had like 150 yards rushing. And that was limiting Darren McFadden because he was that dynamic of a player. He got Tennessee back <laughs> another time in his career, no doubt. But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, when I think of running backs, I think of Darren McFadden. I, I don't think of another running back had a, as impressive SEC career as him. I like that Derrick Henry uh, reference, Stephen. I mean, I think he had the best season ever from an SEC running back, maybe of any position, carrying Alabama to uh, glory his final season there. But he didn't quite make the cut for me. The other running back I got, Stephen, Nick Chubb. I love Nick Chubb. And part of that is him suffering a devastating injury. A lot of people that would have derailed their career, somehow he got stronger. I mean, from the day he stepped on the field at Georgia, he was elite to the day he stepped off of it. And he's another one that could have went to the NFL, believed in Kirby Smart, came back, led the dogs to a national championship appearance. I think uh, he really cemented himself as one of the best running backs in SEC history. And another guy that uh, just missed the cut for me, Todd Gurley. I loved watching him play. I don't know if I've ever seen a guy – Maybe Derrick Henry, but uh, I, I just don't know if I've seen a guy with that size and that speed and that elusiveness. I mean, he, just a rare, rare combo. And unfortunately, his freshman season, I think, was his best season. He got injured. And there was the jersey scandal, if I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, so there was some BS thrown in there. But if, had he put together three seasons like he did his freshman season, I think Todd Gurley would have made my my list. He He just missed it. Absolutely. I think that that's also one of the hard parts about this is some of these guys, and it's true with, with Derrick Henry, uh, but TJ, you know, TJ Yellen, you've had Trent Richardson, you've had Mark Ingram, you've had so many good running backs at some of these programs where you don't have to tote the rock 300 times. I mean, you only make it at 150, 170 carries a year, but that actually works out in your favor, extending your career. It just may hurt you in some of these situations. So I, I like your girly call uh, and, and Nick Chubb as well. I mean, two guys who are insanely talented, also very productive. I'll throw out, how about, kind of throwing it back, Kevin Falk at LSU. I loved watching him play uh, back, back in the day and Trey Mason at Auburn yep. too. So there, there's like a lot of these positions, you just cannot go wrong with some of these selections. It's so deep in terms of talent. Now, how about uh, at receiver, Stephen? Only only naming two guys, so this that made it very difficult for me. I assume it did for you, too. Who's your two top two receivers in SEC in your lifetime? So I think one of these selections for me was really easy. When you look at his stats, you may say, well, from a stat perspective and receiving, he probably doesn't maybe deserve to be on here compared to some of the other names, but it's got to be Percy Harvin. Like just his all-purpose ability, whether it was through rushing and was receiving, you had to find ways to get him the ball. And I think when I think about the all-purpose position, like he sort of defines that for me. So I had to pick Percy Harvin, just a game changer. One of those guys that if I was the head coach, we got to find 15 ways to get him the ball. And however, however we do it, we got to do it. 
The second selection for me, and maybe it's recency bias, I'm going with the Slim Reaper from Alabama, Devonta Smith. Uh, Heisman Trophy winning season by receivers just don't happen very often. Recently, uh, you know, back to back 1,000 yard seasons, uh, the incredible 2020 campaign. So I went with him. I could have went with Jamar Chase, though. That's one of the debates that I had was because Jamar Chase's one season uh, that he had the, the national championship year with LSU was just ridiculous. So uh, also Jordan Matthews from Vanderbilt, incredibly productive career and a key piece of that Vanderbilt team uh, that went to a couple bowl games under James Franklin. Yeah, I'm sitting here shaking my head, Stephen, because I got Devonta Smith and Percy Harvin. <laughs> I was for sure thinking that we were going to disagree on this one. <laughs> but Percy Harvin, I mean, as everything we said about Tim Tebow, I, I won't take any of that back. But Percy Harvin may have been the, the true key to that Urban Meyer run. I mean, he was just so dynamic, such an incredible player, could do it all, running back, receiver, kick returner. I mean, just, you know, he's another one that I wish – uh, I think he had migraines or something in the NFL. I mean, he could have been an all-timer there as well. He he really was kind of like the SEC's version of Reggie Bush. I love Percy Harvin uh, tearing up the SEC, so he's got to be on this list. Devonta Smith, you know, I, I, I know Alabama fans and Georgia fans, unfortunately, remember this, but he was the one that caught the, the second and 26. I mean, from his true freshman year to his final season, which he just terrorized all of college football, just, you know, he didn't quite fit the bills, which you would think of a, an elite receiver, but he was just highly productive, almost, uh, you know, Jerry Rice-esque back there with just, uh, you know, different players, obviously. But like you said, they call him the Slim Reaper for a reason. Very small. I don't remember him ever getting dinged up. Just an incredible, incredible player. And, uh, I mean, just look at his stat line. He has to be on this list, given everything we've seen. Now, guys that just missed the cut. You mentioned Jordan Matthews. When Vanderbilt was really good under uh, James Franklin, he was paramount to that. He was incredible for the Vanderbilt Commodores, so he made my uh, honorable mention there. Mike Evans, Texas A&M, could easily put him on this list. He was fantastic. He gets – I I don't want to credit uh, Johnny Mang Manziel's success to Mike Evans, but he played a huge part of that. Alshon Jeffrey – at South Carolina under Steve Spurrier, a guy that stayed home. And uh, Lane Kiffin famously said he'd be pumping gas if he went to South Carolina. <laughs> well, uh, Kiffin uh, did not last as long as, as Alshon Jeffrey in the SEC. And A.J. Green, he also makes my list. Just going back and watching him at Georgia, uh, you know, his stat line is not going to be as impressive as, as some others, but he was just unstoppable from what I remember, and and yeah, I mean, you could put a, a long list of LSU and Alabama receivers on this list, and, and it'd be right, too. You know what? I, I was going to say, yeah, Odell Beckham, I think, <laughs> you know, is a name that we haven't thrown out who, who could certainly get consideration for this. Uh, you have Jerry Judy, uh, you know, Amari Cooper, Julio Jones. I'll throw out some na other names, too. Like, I think Randall Cobb, you know, insanely productive, maybe didn't have the same amount of quarterbacks, you know, quality of quarterback play that some of these other teams did at times and still had a really productive all-around career. Uh, Craig East at Kentucky as well. Eric Molds at Mississippi mm -hmm. State back in the 90s. Josh Reed um, of LSU. Earl Bennett at Vanderbilt. So, you know, again, I think that this is a position that's had a lot of depth. And I think the other thing is, is we kind of, we've moved into the 2000s. I mean, you see the names that we've talked about, like they just exploded in terms of like the guys that we're considering. It's a much more, you can see the progression of the, and the development of passing in the SEC when you start to see a lot of these names on the list from kind of the last, you know, 10, 15 years. Mm. Now I struggled with tight end, Stephen. So I'm curious to know who you picked as your uh, all SEC tight end. I went with Kyle Pitts. Now, I, I will tell you that I actually considered Brock Bowers here. Um, maybe I'm trying not to be prisoner of the moment too much on this, but the the size and speed and the difference-making ability that Brock Bowers has, it almost if, – if you asked me to put together this list after next year, I wonder if I would have picked him. But I'll go, I went with Kyle Pitts just simply because he was just – you know that 2020 season – that Florida won the SEC East, how big of a factor he was, kind of the mismatch, kind of being a tight end that could move like a receiver. 
we're not necessarily considering, you know, NFL draft stock here, but being such a high pick in the first round. So uh, that season was a little bit shortened by injury. He only had eight games, but still over 700 yards receiving and nearly 18 yards per catch, which is pretty impressive uh, for a tight end. And I'll throw out a couple of guys from Arkansas. I think Hunter Henry and DJ Williams deserve a lot of consideration for this spot as well. Well, Good news, bad news, Stephen. Same guys on my list, but I reversed the order. So at least we're a little bit different here. Only active player on my entire list, Brock Bowers. He's just incredible. Uh, hopefully, you know, he puts up even a, a better stat line this year and, you know, cements himself as, as an all-time SEC tight end. Only sole difference there, Stephen, in my opinion. Uh, not that Kyle Pitts, you know, he got labeled as like a big liability in blocking. I don't think that was accurate, but I would say Brock Bowers, a superior blocker, uh, while Kyle Pitts probably a, re- a superior receiver. But even that is maybe a taking a leap because Brock Bowers is so good. They're both so good. So, yeah, give me Brock Bowers. Kyle Pitts will be my backup. And, uh, yeah, I want to put uh, Hunter Henry on here just for the, the Henry heave, but this is career not just one play award you know what it, it is man it, this is like like we've talked about i mean i hate to sound like a broken record but when you're deciding between brock bowers and kyle pitts it sort of just illustrates <laughs> the talent that's been through this league uh, you know i thought that com- when i was going through tight end it was a position that maybe on the surface didn't appear to be as like as deep as some of these other ones but still i mean if we're talking pitts and brock bowers and dj williams and hunter henry uh that's a pretty good group to be deciding from and I, and you know like Maybe I was trying not. To, I was trying to avoid picking a active player by not picking Brock Bowers. So I don't know, man. I, you can't go wrong with Kyle Pitts or Brock <laughs> Bowers. They're just two of the best tight ends that I've seen since you know I, 2010 or so. Right, right. All right. How about uh, how about your five offensive linemen, Stephen? I'm gonna be honest. Uh, you know, I'm not qualified to sit here and I'm not Cole Kublik breaking down offensive line tape. So I, I went with guys that kind of stood out to me during their time and just were dominant forces. So I'm, I'm very curious to hear your five. Yeah, this was tough. I mean, this is a really hard position to evaluate. I think a lot of times I will default to some of the awards that some of these guys have won. So I went with Chris Samuels of Alabama, Marquise Pouncey of Florida, Barrett Jones of Alabama, Sean Andrews of Arkansas, and Michael Orr of Ole Miss. You could throw up some other guys in there too, such as Andre Smith at Alabama, Cam Robinson, uh, Luke Jokel, guys, even going back to like Alan Fanica at LSU. I mean, hard to necessarily consider uh, NFL careers here, but if you're looking for a guy who's, you know, uh, put together a, a, you know, a sterling reputation, the NFL as being one of the best blockers, Alan Fanica is it, Kendall Simmons at Auburn as well. So this, this was this was a hard position because you're trying to find the right, you know, kind of five overall. But I think some of those names like Pouncey and Barrett Jones kind of stood out to me kind of obvious picks. Well, good news, Stephen. Only three of the five. (laughs) 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 Well, yeah, Barrett Jones, I mean, he anchored a multinational championship run at Alabama. Uh, You know, I mean, I just remember his time there. They were just a a force on the ground and, and obviously not one offensive lineman was, was the the key but he was just a team leader so that's why he made my list sean andrews you mentioned him just an incredible incredible lineman for arkansas there same deal with them i mean they didn't win national championships but they came pretty damn close uh to you know being lead or nation leader in rushing when sean andrews was there because he was so good michael orr i mean my goodness when they write novels and, and movies over your recruitment i mean you know, you're you're an elite prospect, and he lived up to it there uh, in Oxford. So I, I put Michael Orr on there. Uh, you mentioned Chris Samuels. I went with Andre Smith. <laughs> I mean, basically, same deal. True freshman, started at left tackle at Alabama. They went on a, a string there, Stephen. I, th- I think they had three straight guys where they come in, elite prospects, started as true freshmen, went three years, NFL. Three years, NFL. Three years. I mean, I don't know how. That's That was paramount to, to all the Nick Saban's success. And one guy you didn't mention, but uh, I'm sure you you recognize him as a great lineman, Frank Ragnow from Arkansas. He's on my list. Uh, played under Sam Pittman and, and Brett Bielema down there 
and he's still killing it in the NFL. So give me Frank Rag now to uh, round out my five on the offensive line. I'd say anyone that played, you know, at Arkansas under Sam Pittman and who was, you know, <laughs> kind of regarded as one of the best in the nation is definitely worthy of being considered for this team because Pittman has one of the best eyes and, and talent uh, judging of offensive linemen. You know, something on Barrett Jones too, I had forgotten about this um, as, as I was going through this exercise was his versatility. You know, the fact that he started all over the line at Alabama and just being not only a leader, but being so versatile. And you don't you don't see many linemen being able to move from guard to center to tackle uh, that often and be that successful in college football. So I think that was kind of he was already kind of an obvious pick. But then once you start, you start kind of going back in your memory and you start realizing some of these things it just sort of uh, entrenched him on my team. And also Sean Andrews won the blocking trophy twice in the SEC. I mean, you don't see that happen too many times for a lineman to be dominant and win it twice but he did and i think just arkansas with some of the rushing attacks and like you said nearly leading the nation of rushing certainly well deserving of a place on this team all right how about uh flip it over to the defensive side steven two defensive ends uh i'm curious to know where you go here because the sec again i mean sec is loaded at every position but uh, particularly these monsters on the defensive front so I think both of the end positions were actually pretty easy for me, and they come from the SEC East. David Pollock of Georgia, All-American three times, 36 sacks, two-time SEC Player of the Year. You know, Unfortunately, his NFL career was cut short due to injury, but man, he was so dominant. I could still see the play of him against South Carolina in my head uh, you know, every time I see Georgia and South Carolina play. And speaking of plays, it's obvious when you mentioned Jadivion Clowney, like the play against Michigan in the bowl game, like that's one of the most memorable plays uh, for me in, in recent bowl years. He was a high profile, had the high profile recruitment, came to South Carolina as a true freshman and dominated. And, you know, you think about line of scrimmage and how hard it is sometimes for true freshmen to come in and play right away, offensive, defensive linemen, and he did, and he was great. And, you know, unfortunately, at the end of his career, I had some injuries. But, man, Clowney and Pollock uh, were my two picks at defensive end. Yeah, I mean, I think you got to put David Pollock on this list. He's on mine. I, I hope a lot of people, uh, you know, remember him playing because he tr- transformed his body, and now he's ESPN and all this. Like, you wouldn't think he was a monster – on the line of scrimmage, but he was in the SEC, one of the most dominant linemen I've ever seen play. And like you said, him not really playing much in the NFL due to injury. Again, I hope that doesn't, uh, you know, people forget that he was such a great, great player. This is SEC list, not NFL list. Uh, Clowney, I could certainly see I considered it. Only thing, and this is maybe a weird pet peeve of mine. I mean, I just remember Steve Spurrier basically calling the guy out saying, I don't think he wants to try this year, you know, it's like, and because he had number one money on the line, I get it, but uh, you know that that kind of stuck with me. So uh, the only reason he didn't make the list, I I love this other guy. This is when I first started watching, uh, you know, SEC football on a hardcore level. But Javon Curse at Florida, I mean, they called him a freak for a reason. He was incredible, incredible athlete. And um, I just remember him being one of the, that's when I really started getting into the line play when I was watching Javon Curse terrorize SEC quarterback. So I got to give it up to the freak. Him and David Pollock are, are my two defensive ends. I was going to say, if your nickname is the freak and you saw how, <laughs> like how big of an impact he made in the NFL when he came in. And again, I know we're not talking about NFL stats, but you just saw the, the freakish talent, speed, power coming off the end. I mean, Curse was, yeah, he was certainly in the mix for me, along with Miles Garrett, uh, Alex Brown, also, you know, from Florida, and John Abraham uh, of South Carolina, you know, one of the guys I think we, we've kind of maybe not necessarily forgotten about in this modern era of college football, but a guy who was very productive at South Carolina. Yeah. All right. How about some uh, defensive linemen that are a little bit more interior? Who do you got uh, as your two picks there? Tough call here, but I think one of them's pretty easy, and that's Big John Henderson of Tennessee. I mean, you talk about you know guys who were impactful when you know, I, like I mentioned, I started watching college football in the 93-94, and I just remember how dominant John Henderson was, even on those Je- Jefferson Pilot Sports broadcasts where the picture was a little fuzzy. Uh, he, you could just tell he was dominant on the interior, and also for me. Uh, Glenn Dorsey was my second pick, you know, two-time All-American, won the Lombardi, Outland, Nagurski, 15 sacks in his career. Uh, I think those two, and you could 
throw in Terrence Cody, Richard Seymour. There's a there's a whole host of defensive line in the SEC you could pick for these. Yeah, I I love De- Glenn Dorsey. I mean, I he's on my list. I believe he was uh, paramount to uh, LSU winning a national championship. Uh, I mean, when I think of defensive linemen, I I think of Glenn Dorsey at LSU. So he's on my list as well. Um, I like John Henderson. He just missed the cut for me. Richard Seymour just missed the cut. Albert Hainsworth was awesome in college. Nick Fairley was a beast for Auburn. He Without him, you know, he and Cam Newton, they would not have led that Auburn team to a national championship. But one guy, I don't think this guy gets enough credit. And you could technically say he was an end, but he could he could basically play all the positions. And his team fell just short. I think that's why this defense does not get the credit. But I think maybe the best defense I've ever seen in the SEC, maybe until – until Georgia's recent runs. But prior to that, I believe it was 2016 Alabama. I thought the best player on that defense was Jonathan Allen. So he makes the cut for me. They fell just short in the national championship game. Um, I believe that was the uh, Hunter Renfro uh, (laughs) pick play game. But uh, Jonathan Allen, for me, one of the most dynamic defense alignment I've ever seen. So he and, and Glenn Dorsey, give me those two. Was was John Henderson like your third choice there? I'm curious to know who you were deciding between Allen Henderson or was it some other combination of linemen? Uh, I had John Henderson fourth, and I had Nick Fairley third. And I I know Fairley was, from what I remember, it was I don't want to call him a one year wonder, but it was he was just so dynamic, such a wrecking force for that Auburn Gene Chizik defense. Again, I mean, I, I can't say it enough. Without him, they don't win the national championship, and uh, they were not the same unit without him the next year. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Fairley's one of those guys that I think that, you know, you, you may, we may have forgotten about like how good he was just because of Cam Newton and how much, you know, Cam Newton's, um, you know, performance that year kind of overshadowed things. But, yeah, I mean, I fairly, like I mentioned, Richard Seymour, uh, also throwing it back to Chad Lavalle at LSU. There's a guy that was very productive and kind of before this era in the SEC. Yeah. But, man, I mean, you just, like you said, you go down the list of John Henderson, Albert Hainsworth. Uh, there's, you know, maybe in a couple of years we'll look back. I think Jalen Carter and some of these other guys deserve to be in this mix too. But there's plenty of talent here at defensive tackle. Now, who you got at linebacker? I went um, I went three linebackers here. I hope you did too. Man, one selection was easy, and that is Patrick Willis from Ole Miss. Uh, just all over the field and, and during his career at Ole Miss, dominant. You know, he was also dominant in the NFL, two-time All-American, won the Butkus Award. No-brainer pick for me. For the other two spots, I went with Al Wilson of Tennessee. You know, again, kind of watching college football in the 90s and 2000s, like Al Wilson was one of those guys that – he was just a bad man. Like when it comes to, de- to defense and, you know, stopping the run, getting after people, uh, he was fun to watch for me. I went with CJ Mosley from Alabama as my third selection. There's a whole host of names here that I considered, but I just thought somebody from the, the Alabama defense has got to be on there at linebacker with the run of linebackers they had. And of course, Mosley, uh, he was probably the best of the bunch, I think. Stephen, people are not going to believe that we didn't. Sw- see each other's list prior to this but Patrick Willis yes he's my favorite all-time SEC linebacker I've said that many times before so I gotta put him number one on this list he went to to go play for Coach O I believe it was uh it was during the Orgeron era and they were awful but they had the best linebacker in the dang SEC so give me Patrick Willis give me Al Wilson captain National championship team. Tennessee doesn't come close to winning the national championship, in my opinion, that year without Al Wilson anchoring that defense, leading that team to the 1998 national championship. And third, maybe a little recent, but I loved watching Devin White play. And it was not because he rode around horses, even though that was pretty cool. But just the speed, the the veracity, I mean, he was just an all-world linebacker for LSU. And uh, it's kind of troubling to think, Stephen, they won the national championship the year after he left, how good they could have been. Because <laughs> he left school early. Had he come back for another season, oh, man, that I've, I've stayed up thinking about that at night sometimes. But Devin White, for me, I just I don't know that I've ever seen a speed from that 
uh, from a linebacking position than I have seen from Devin White. He's an all-timer for me. Yeah, for sure. LSU's defense that year could have definitely used him. I mean, we, <laughs> you know, we talk about like you know the best one season by a team since like the start of the BCS era. I mean, LSU is is up there, if not number one or number two. And certainly, I think if you throw in if Devin White had come back, I mean, that only enhances their case. You know, when I was going through this, you know, it was interesting to think about some guys like Jarvis Jones, who is so uh, disruptive and, and caused so much havoc off the edge at Georgia. Uh, same thing. You know, I threw Will Anderson on here just because of maybe his recency bias, but just the havoc that he caused week in and week out. And then you got your kind of, you know, your prototypical like inside linebackers, you know, guys like Roquan Smith, Rolando McLean, Donta Hightower, other guys who were in this mix for me as well. I I, I think, like you said, Devin White's certainly very deserving. Um, I could probably go four or five guys here and feel pretty good about it. Yeah, and if we were just doing one year, Stephen, uh, Josh Allen, his final year at Kentucky, he he would make a list like this. I mean, he was <laughs> he was incredible. Two two star to. 20 sacks nearly his final year at Kentucky. Um, but again, this is more of a, in my mind, a career type award. All right. How about you? Who are your two cornerbacks, Steven? Man, this is tough. You know, I hate to, I hate to sound like a broken record, but you know, you start looking at the history of the sec, you know, like we said, since the nineties or so, and you go down the names of some of the, the cornerbacks, um, I, I settled on champ Bailey from Georgia and Patrick Peterson at LSU <laughs> You know, when I when I would go back and think about like Champ Bailey at Georgia, I think about just you know not only being a you know kind of lockdown cover guy, but I think about the versatility. You know, I think about being on special teams, being used on offense. I'm sort of he was not necessarily Percy Harvin before Percy Harvin, but that versatility that um you know was so valuable to that Georgia team. So it's kind of for defense, but also versatility. Patrick Peterson, you know, was a threat on special teams. He won the Benaric, he won the Thorpe lockdown cover guy on the outside for LSU. So for me, it was Champ Bailey and Patrick Peterson at the two corner spots. I got Champ Bailey and Patrick Peterson. (laughs) I almost put the honey badger, Tyron Matthew on here, but you get booted from the team. Uh, I can't put you on a roster like this, but he was, he certainly was dynamic, but Champ Bailey, I mean, heck he, he played both ways and he was probably the first, uh, you know, true cover corner, that I remember playing in the SEC, just being a, a true lockdown player that that defense, or excuse me, offenses in the SEC were scared to challenge. Champ Bailey, when I think of elite corners, I think of Champ Bailey and Patrick Peterson. I mean, everything you just said, we could say Mo Claiborne. Uh, I mean, they had Tredavious White. They had, uh, they just went on a, a crazy, crazy run down there at LSU with defensive backs, but Patrick Peterson leads the way, in my opinion. I think he might be the best uh, uh, corner, true corner, that uh, with the size and, and speed and everything. I mean, he, it, he's almost a no-brainer for a list like this. You know what? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll throw out a few other guys that I considered. You know, Joe Hayden at Florida, Patrick Sertain at Alabama. If I squint and think back really hard, I can think back to Antonio Langham, when he played at Alabama and some of the difference making plays that he had. And of course, a lot of those games were on those fuzzy Jefferson pilot sports <laughs> broadcast. So I, I'm not sure if I actually saw that or not, uh, but no, you mentioned Morris Claiborne, uh, Carlos Rogers too at Al- at Auburn. So, I mean, you know, plenty of guys here, but I think, you know, Peterson was, it was easy for me. And then it was a side in between champ Bailey and some of these other names. Vernon Hargraves was another one that I considered at Florida. They, they had quite the run of uh, defensive backs down there too. All right, how about uh, safety? Who you got your two safety positions? I'll be curious if this was the same thing for you because I thought this was actually like slam dunk, easy picks. Uh, Eric Berry for me was an easy (laughs) pick at safety. I mean, you know, his story in the NFL is awesome, being able to come back after the major health uh, issue that he had. Then to look at his college career, 14 interceptions, 31 passes defended, all SEC, all America, the resume, the production, the stats, it's all there. And then I went with Minka Fitzpatrick at the other spot, you know, won the Benaric, won the Thorpe. Um, The other part of it is just when you watch the, you know, watch him play, it's the awareness it's, you know, high. I mean, I don't know if there's many players who have a better like situational football kind of awareness IQ than him at safety. He just seems, and it's true in the NFL. It just seems like he's, Wherever the ball is going, Minka Fitzpatrick's going to be there and is sort of the leader of those uh, defenses at Alabama in the secondary. He was an easy second pick for me. 
Well, of course, I had it. Uh, <laughs> Eric Berry on the list, Tennessee grad over here, but uh, he he was there when I when I was there. So I'm, I've always been a huge fan of his, and uh, you know his. I think he was just short, Stephen. After two years of being, it was either Tennessee or the SEC. I, I think it was Tennessee all time interception return yard leader and then they never threw his way again so he couldn't break the record I, I remember that being a thing but yeah I mean he was elite he was he was just one of those guys wherever the ball was he found a way to be there he was the hardest hitter I still think of him uh, I thought he killed no Sean Moreno that one time he killed him one time he and Tim Tebow uh, collided and it was like the immovable object meets the uh, unstoppable force I I thought the world might explode when that happened thankfully it didn't but uh, yeah so Eric Berry and that's to, not to even mention his return skills as well uh, but I did consider Minka Fitzpatrick he just missed the cut for me Steve but I I actually like Landon Collins from Alabama I mean we're sitting here debating two of the best all-time Alabama defensive backs. So that gives you an indication of how good they've been down there in Tuscaloosa. You, There is no wrong answer. Landon Collins, Minka Fitzpatrick, uh, just two of the better players to ever suit up in the SEC. Also, LaRon Le- Landry uh, was another name that kind of floated around for this position for me. Mark Barron, throughout Reggie Nelson, too, uh, from his time at Florida. Um you know, I just I go back to what I said about Fitzpatrick and, you know, sometimes it's hard to put into a stat. And, and like you said, I mean, a lot of these defensive backs are so good. They just don't get the ball thrown to him. So sometimes it's like if you look at the interceptions and the passes defended, it really doesn't tell you um, the quality of of how some of these guys are in terms of coverage because they just don't get thrown the ball. Uh, but, you know, just watching Fitzpatrick and, and I know I hate to go back to the NFL example, but man. I mean, just just being all over the field, kind of being the quarterback of the back end of the defense and his situational uh, you know, high football IQ. It's always one of those things that stood out to me is just uh, kind of why he should be on a team like this. Mm-hmm. Now, Stephen, I did ask you, uh, I'm curious to know if you have two good examples of uh, kick and, and punt returners. Do do any stand out uh, in SEC history to you? Absolutely. So what was interesting was when I was looking back at the the kick return and punt return, you find that the SEC, there's actually a debate. Like at first I was kind of thinking like these two guys are automatic. That wasn't the case for me. Uh, I went in and I, I went ahead and went with Felix Jones from Arkansas as my kick returner. A couple other names, you know, you could throw out there too, but you know, he averaged almost 32 yards a kick return as a freshman in 05, four kickoff returns for touchdowns in his career. At punt return, I went with Javier Arenas from Alabama. Uh, seven punt return for touchdowns in his career. Uh, also returned 125 punts, and you see the career average around 14 yards. That's really good for having that many returns. We'll throw out one player that I think if he played in the 2000s, he would be getting some maybe more love for all purpose and, and specialists, and that's David Palmer at Alabama. Uh, you know, like I kind of made the joke, he played in the Jeff- Jefferson Pilot Sports era. But, you know, he played some receiver, played some quarterback at times when Alabama needed him to. He was kind of like a wildcat player. But he was also really good on punt returns back in uh, 1991. So just a little bit before my time. Uh, but the few years that I got to watch David Palmer at Alabama, I thought he was probably a little bit underrated. Well, great news, Stephen. This We're totally different on this one. <laughs> I would kick returner Cordero Patterson from Tennessee. He only played one year, but uh, man, he was just so so good, so big, so fast. I, I, that's he's probably the biggest guy I've ever seen kick return for a touchdown. But uh, and then obviously he went on to much success in the NFL. But I think had he been at Tennessee a longer, he probably would have shattered some SEC kick return records. So when I think of kick return standouts, I think of Cordero Patterson, and then I cannot. For the life of me, Stephen, if you mention the name Joe Adams to me, I just hear or see 10 Tennessee defenders make just looking like idiots out there. So to me, the uh, Javier Arenas, that's probably the right answer. But subjectively, Joe Adams for me, best punt returner, or at least the, the best single punt return I've ever seen in my life. Arkansas Razorbacks. Give me Joe Adams there. 
can't argue with that because I'm seeing it in my head as we're talking about how crazy <laughs> that play is. I mean, you know, it's an interesting debate on a team like this. Is like, you know, sometimes the stats don't necessarily match up with what we see. Like the, the player can be, you know, it, it's like we talked about with running backs. Like a player can just be more talented but have fewer opportunities. But sometimes it's like on the return man, it's like who do you not want to kick it to? And, and Joe Adams with a play like that, um, at other times during his career, very, I think, qualified for a spot like this, even if he didn't have the numbers. And I mean, you, know, you, you look back at the history, I mean, Skylar Green at LSU, Derek Abney of Kentucky, uh, there are all some really uh, well-qualified options here in the return. So I can't argue if you go with Joe Adams or or even Patterson. I, You know, that's kind of a shame on me for only for not giving him the credit for how dominant he was that one season. <laughs> Yeah, so let us know who you think had the better team in the comments. It's Essentially, Stephen, it's going to come down to uh, do you like Kyle Pitts or do you like Brock Bowers? Because yeah. the rest of the list is so similar. But, uh, no, I, I do – I joke. I really appreciate you uh, putting in so much time and consideration to, to doing this list on short notice. But uh, uh, I just thought this would be perfect off-season content that the fans – should enjoy and just hitting on as many sec teams as we possibly could on this one so i i can't thank you enough for for joining the show absolutely yeah this was a this was a fun exercise to put together i, I wasn't sure if i should tell you thank you for causing me like hours of anguish trying to figure out these selections but there, there's one part of like college football that i you know really enjoy which is going back and thinking about previous years and some of the players that we've seen. And, and you know, it was funny to, to be watching some of these players on YouTube now th- and, and to putting this together. You know, I would think about Jordan Matthews, have to go find a Jordan Matthews play on YouTube. So I love the off-season <laughs> nostalgia stuff. So so thanks, as always, for having me on, putting me through some anguish to figure out uh, my favorite players of the SEC. Well, and speaking of Jordan Matthews, I don't know why this is in – it's like burned in my memory, but I think it was – they were playing – Ole Miss. I could be wrong on the opponent, but there was a there was a game where he got hit so hard. I think I can't remember if it was in the head or the stomach, and he was literally vomiting on the field. And I was thinking, oh my god, we got to get this guy off the field. He can't. I mean, player safety, right? And then about two plays later, he's scoring uh, a game defining touchdown, which. Maybe in today's modern football, we wouldn't have kept him on the field. I'm not advocating for for that. But I'm just saying, man, he was just incredibly tough. And that's what I think of when I do a list like this is who are the players that I remember decades later just gutting it out, doing whatever they had to do to help their team on the field, get that W. And uh, I think with these teams we've assembled, Stephen, I mean, (laughs) there's no chance – we would lose a game with these guys. You know what? Oh, no question. I'll, I'll take on the rest of the, the the college football world the last, <laughs> you know, 20 years or so with these two, with these SEC teams uh, ready to take on everybody else. You know, I think that Jordan Matthews thing, was that not the season opener against Ole Miss that year? It feels like that was the, I'm, you know, I hate that every year it seems like it goes on quicker <laughs> these days than I might be forgetting, but I, I do remember that play that you're talking about uh, just sort of epitomized the toughness of, of Jordan Matthews and also just his value to, to Vanderbilt. Yeah. Well, Stephen, uh, before you go w- one more time, can you tell the audience uh, where's the best place to find all your work and to get uh, a pre-order of the Athlon Sports College Football Preview Magazine? Absolutely. So you can follow me on Twitter at Athlon Stephen. You can check out my work on YouTube, all CFB365. And the magazine hits newsstands on May 23rd. But if you want to go ahead and order it now, it's available on our website, athlonsports.com magazines at the very top they'll start shipping out shipping them out as soon as they get them in uh, over there in the warehouse so we've got sec east and sec west covers uh, available at athlonsports.com all right thank you again steven i really really appreciate it and uh, i know the fans are they're gonna have some fun with this one yeah man thanks for having me on i really appreciate it